astronomy. Guys, as I promised, more science stories. Do I know all the details? Of course not. But um, this was teased. This is one of those announcements where the scientists go, hey, we're going to do something pretty. We got a pretty exciting announcement Thursday at such and such date. And then everybody's like, oh, wow, they, they teased it. Normally, you don't do that. You just put it out there and it just becomes part of the churn. But uh, what they discovered, and uh, this is preliminary, although there's still going to be more research put into this, and um, by monitoring pulsars, which are these highly energetic, uh, I think they're neutron stars or something, but there's these stars that are the, uh, the, the <laughs> I believe they're the cores of suns that have gone through the red giant phase. And it doesn't happen to all of them. It's usually very large stars become pulsars. Um, but they, they're spitting out these giant jets of energy, these huge, I think they're gamma rays. I could be wrong. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there's people who know this stuff that are rolling their, their eyes at me as I deserve, but they are like giant beams of light. They're huge. They're, and they, and they're blade blasts out very regularly. They, and, and usually they spin incredibly fast, like hundreds of times a second fast, like 10 times a second is incredibly fast for something that weighs the size of multiple suns of ours or, or, or something like that. They're, they're, they're these really powerful objects. Um, and they're, uh, I think it varies, but they're usually spinning. The pulsar jet is usually like a little wobbly. So it's not just like a, like an axis straight up that spins. It's actually, it, so it's like this big giant thing that goes around and they're incredibly stable and predictable. So what they've done is by studying this, uh, these pulsars and more and more ash, more and more, uh, um, uh, facilities are coming on board that are going to be, give us so much better fidelity, better information detail. Uh, so we'll be able to study this stuff even with much more clarity, uh, in a broader way, um, by monitoring the exact timing of these and then looking for little dips and slight changes to the pulsars. I don't know how many they're following. It's like 10 to 15. It's, I'm not sure if that's correct, but um, they're able to detect gravitational waves. Essentially, they've turned the galaxy into a detector using these, what we know, uh, what we understand about how the pulsars are supposed to behave. And then they're able to like tease out that this one actually dipped a little bit. And then that one over there moved a little bit. It was a little off time. And this is incredible stuff. <laughs> But they're able to then piece out or, 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 or tease out of that, that there is this kind of constant hum, like right here. Um, we could just read it, I guess. Uh, the universe is continuously rippling with gravitational waves, a 15-year survey has reported. Uh, using pulsars as distant beacons and radio telescopes to plumb the galaxy, a massive collaboration of astronomers and physicists has found strong evidence of a gravitational wave background undulating through the cosmos. A single wave may take years to decades to crest and fall. So gravitational waves are caused by dis um, intense disruptions in what you call the fabric of, of, of space-time, but it's where usually it's supermassive black holes. It's generally b binary partners where two huge, 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 huge black holes spinning around each other. Um, a few years back, some years back, they uh, didn't record the audio, but they recorded a, a merger of two black holes. And they were able to then take that, because the frequency goes up as these things are spinning. As they get closer, they start to spin faster. It was on the Colbert show. I don't have the video of this, but it's, so they played the noise, you know, using like, okay, we're going to just, we can make this sound something. And it sounds like this. It goes, Zoop. it's like, Whoop. Whoop. it's like that. That was a better one. It's so it's, but like to make a high pitch frequency, when you have objects, many, 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 many times the size of the sun spinning around a single point, because they're about to combine into one giant black hole to make a, whoop, like it's fuck. It's, it's like powers and forces beyond uh, anything that's conceivable to a human brain. <laughs> it's, it's really fucking cool shit. So the, when these things, and it's not just the mergers, it can also, the, so as these, incredibly intense um, concentrations of mass are circling each other. They're actually bending gravity a little bit and they send out 
waves. They literally are stretching space itself. Um, gravity actually transmits at the same causality rate that light does. Uh, so if the sun were to like suddenly disappear, we would not know it for eight minutes because the sun, uh, eight and a half, it's something like that. The sun's light has to cross all that distance, but we would also continue to orbit exactly as if the sun were there for eight minutes. And as soon as the gravity absence, if we disappeared the sun, difficult, difficult to do. So unlikely to happen. As soon as that reaches us, the gravity, then we would just fly off in a straight line. It would be a really bad day for everybody. The, the sun would turn off and then our physics would just jolt us all into some weird direction and the earth would just suddenly freeze and go off in a straight line and it would all, it would be, it would, it would, it would be a, a horror, <laughs> but, um, gravity is an instant. It's not instantaneous. It, it, it's this, that's why the, like the whole concept of light, the light speed of the universe is actually the speed of causality. So it's the speed at which information crosses space, crosses through the distance between objects and gravity is exactly it, it, it's the, the speed of uh, gravity is the same as the speed of light. It's because it, they're both the same thing, which is the speed of causality. Uh, and that's fascinating. And so these things are, are pumping. They're like little heavy, big pumps that are like, doof, 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 just hammering away because they're so big. And because we, now that we can kind of let these pulsars tell us, we can map the ways that these gravitational, um, information is being changed in the, in the universe and in, in, in the galaxy, which is a very, we, we, we happen to be in a pretty big galaxy too, above average. So it's amazing. It's really cool stuff. And this is going to bring on more and more, um, knowledge and information to this. So, uh, yeah, here, the detection of these background gravitational waves is a long awaited result. Scientists think that these waves largely resulted from pairs of supermassive black holes at the centers of merging galaxies with some contribution, possibly from the big bang itself. The ability to measure these waves directly should inform scientists about the origin and history of the universe. Isn't that nice? So the hum, a hum in space, when gravitational waves pass, they cause space time or the fabric of the universe to ripple like a wiggling waterbed. Ooh. I think having sex on a waterbed seems it could be uh, hard and annoying, right? I would definitely do it. Don't get me wrong. You know, it'd probably be fun because it's, you know, but like, it doesn't seem like a good surface for banging. I'd rather get in the waterbed. I'd rather make it, enter it into a pool, cut the top off and then have sex inside the water. <laughs> this is good science talk. Um, binary systems of massive objects like black holes and neutron stars create these waves as the objects spiral toward each other and their accelerations increase, they send off energy as gravitational waves. The first ever detection of gravitational waves was reported in 2015 by the researchers at the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, a set of mile-long obser observatories in Washington and Louisiana. But the signals observed by LIGO and subsequent similar facilities can only detect gravitational waves that resonate at high frequencies. This is because they are produced by relatively small objects, merging neutron stars or black holes born from single supernova explosions. So that's the whoop, that's the high frequency I was talking about. But scientists have long predicted an, another form of gravitational waves, a continuous hum produced by pairs of supermassive black holes, each with a mass of millions to billions of suns, slowly spiraling toward each other. These emit lower frequency gravitational waves and observatories like LIGO can detect. These stochastic or background gravitational waves are rumbling from all over the universe at the speed of light, gently buffeting Earth from all directions. So there's just this constant... Do, 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 do. <laughs> of these huge, slow, big waves that are being caused by gigantic things spinning around each other. It's just so cool, man. It's so neat that they, and, and they're able to like tease out that this is a thing. Um, yeah. The, oh, so LIGO is what it is, is it's two L shaped lasers, right? So they have, it's, it's a 90 degree thing. They're, they're, what is it, what does it say? A mile, mile long. Um, they're really big because they're mile long. So they have like one side of it is a laser that goes that way. And then 90 degrees off that is a laser that goes that way. And they, they're able to read the, um, disruptions in the time that it takes for the laser to come back across that mile. And because it's a 90 degree thing at the same spot in the earth, they can actually like tell very sensitive, it's very sensitive, but they can read 
the high frequency gravitational difference from one side to the other. And then they have another, so there's two of them. That is like a, a, a proven successful prototype kind of thing because there's another project planned. I don't know the name of it. And I might be using three, but they're going to do this in space. So people say, you know, the earth itself has all these noises. It has earthquakes. There's, you know, reasons like they have to account for all that shit while they're at these facilities. Like, I mean, of course they, they do account for that. Um, why don't we just put these laser things in space? We basically just need three stations, I guess. I think, I, th I, I do think it is a triangle. So there's a mission planned. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to be and it. And the distances that they're they'll be able to do is far, far, far bigger than one mile. So this is cool. This is cool shit that they're going to be doing stuff like that. Eventually they'll have, uh, um, a far greater ability to, to read all that stuff. Another kind of thing. What's interesting about this is that it's the reason this gravitational wave stuff is, 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 uh, a big deal is that. Up until now, up until 2015, actually, the only data we were able to receive and record was light, was electromagnetic radiation. And we can do a pretty good job at that. We've gotten a lot of practice at it, not just visible light, but everything on either side. Uh, that's the power of the James Webb Space Telescope is that it's so cold. It's cooled down so much that it, it's actually very good for infrared, which if the machine itself is a little bit too warm, then infrared becomes invisible. I mean, it's, it's always invisible to our eyes, but like the machine in order to detect the most distant infrared we can, it has to be chilled and cold and it's does a good job at that. And the, the next one they're planning is even bigger. So that's still just electromagnetic radiation. Gravitational waves are outside that they're not electromagnetic. They're gra gravity. They're, 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 they're gravity being big old fat waves of gravity being pushed around. And so that's a second source of data. It's a second kind of information that we can acquire. There's a third one now, and this is a new, new it's, it's a new, there's a neutrino detector. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson did a thing where he's in a neutrino detector. Um, it's a big room filled with water and all these like copper colored balls, but there's a, a thing called, ah, shit. It's a cube of ice in Antarctica. It's a kilometer long and it's not actually like they didn't build the ice. They drilled holes along this cube around in a square, basically. So they drilled deep holes and they put detector something or other down in each one. So they're able to like turn this gigantic cube of ice in Antarctica into a neutrino detector. So neutrinos are these tiny little, um, particles that don't interact with mass or they very, very rarely interact with mass. Um, otherwise we wouldn't ever be able to, to detect them, but they're like, there's trillions of them in your body right now. They're, they're coursing through all like human, everything. They're everywhere. They're, they fill the universe. They, um, when stars go supernova, the, uh, we do have more than one, uh, like that's not the only neutrino detector. There's, there's neutrino detectors in the world. And so the, the first thing that happens that's detectable when a star actually, when the core collapses inside a star, you can't tell it doesn't automatically blow up. But the first thing that happens is that neutrinos start pouring out of the star because they're not impeded by the mass of the star. Everything else has to sort of go a little bit slower. And once it all hits, it goes very fast, obviously. But the very first thing is all of a sudden neutrino production just goes crazy. So when a star, when they detect that a star is about to go supernova, they can tell because all of a sudden neutri neutrino uh, presence production increases. And if they can dial it into a direction, they can say, oh my God, that star is probably about to blow up or something. Or they can, they can there's actually like useful science that can come out of that. So this big one in Antarctica is a huge cube with the drilled holes. It's very cool. And so there, every once in a while, one of these trillions and trillions and trillions of neutrinos that's streaming through all mass, all matter at all times will actually interact with some kind of particle. Um, you can just search for a neutrino detector aquarium. There's a way to like use like this foggy shit inside a fish tank, an empty glass box, like a, you know, not no fish or anything. And, uh, you see these little lines that show up 
because those are like the very rare neutrinos. There's just, but because there's trillions and trillions of them, if it's a tiny, tiny percentage, it's still like kind of frequent, like every second or two or whatever. I don't know how frequent it is, you know, but that's the third reading that we now have. So we have electromagnetic radiation, uh, gravitational waves and neutrinos. There's three separate buckets of data that can now be kind of monitored and collected and we can improve our ability to, to sort of read all this stuff. I love it. I think it's cool. Is it going to save lives? Maybe not. Is a percentage of the budgets of, of the, of the planet and the kind of things that human beings are capable of doing. I think it's a wonderful thing that we have this, that this ability, um, and that we're able to, uh, increase our knowledge and answer some of these questions and ask new amazing questions and give us some interesting insights into the way this mysterious thing we call existence functions and stuff, you know, can't just rely on assholes like me who are going to make some shit up because they thought about it while they were falling asleep. That's what that used to be the source of information. <laughs> I think I figured it out. I thought about it really hard. I, 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 I think a little bit harder than most people and that makes me right. So listen up everybody. I do actually believe, see here, here we go. I, I think that the, uh, the heat death, the, the, I love entropy. It's my favorite concept. The, uh, to think of entropy as d difference, I, I shouldn't go down this too much, but, uh, low entropy is actually the concentrated difference. And then high entropy is increased disorder. So. Entropy is a measure of, of basically of how much disorder there is. So it's at the very far, far, far end of, of, uh, the universe, according to the heat death of the universe, the theory that it all trends towards absolute zero, it trends towards perfect evenness, the death of difference. So sameness is increasing basically by dis disorder is increasing, which means everything eventually becomes the same. My, my personal theory <laughs> is that it eventually reaches a point where it becomes half a wave. I know that doesn't make, I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody, but in order to sustain a universe, you have to have detectable difference. And at some point it reaches a part where there's nothing, there's no frequency whatsoever. And every single thing in every single direction is exactly the same, at which point it collapses or some, some sort of uh, cycle starts back over because of the death of difference, the true death of difference. Um, it's, an, it's I think, and I also think that uh, a lot of that has to do with consciousness. I think that biology is, uh, when you start applying this concept to the notion of systems being closed or open, um, biology is, you know, your body, the earth itself, we are open systems. We, we don't function unless we are taking in new input. We need food, you know, we need water, energy, we need social, you know, you know, there's reasons, but you, all, you take away those things and you die. You take away the sun, the earth dies. It, it, it's a close, it's a, it's an open system because it needs it. Um, it has to have inputs in order for it to sustain what it's doing with entropy. I think biology, each body, each, each plant, each animal, each thing, and then you get, the more complex it gets, it has to do with the rate of information deletion. So that like essentially your brain, the reason I think human beings do have a higher form of consciousness is that our minds are more capable of storing information than others, uh, because of education, because of teaching, because of the social nature of evolu of our evolution we uh, became these incredibly information heavy dependent animals because we communicate, we read each other all the time. We transmit information across time using language, using abstract concepts. Like ab abstraction is not real, but it's also very real. It's literally driven our evolution. There's a gene that evolved, they think to that um, gave us the ability to enunciate words that our tongue functions the way our tongues are so precise and useful for language creation. This uh, is believed that this gene wouldn't have evolved with, were it not for um, humans being social creatures who needed to talk, needed to, to communicate. And, and so I think that entropy, the concept of entropy is related to um, consciousness in the sense that like consciousness is almost like the visible light spectrum of sustained information storage. The universe does not store information. 
That's actually completely incorrect. The, the universe is itself information storage. That's what time is. Because <laughs> if you look across time, you're looking at stored information that's just only now arriving at your location. Um, and you go really far back. But our brains, our bodies, our nervous systems hold information. And um, it, I think consciousness is an emergent property, is, a, is, a necess, is a, an operant condition of the need to hold on to all that knowledge, all that information. And I mean it in like a, not like specifically the weight, you know, of your dog when you were four, although that is interesting. Not just like literal information that you think of in your world, but like the the, the notion that um, you're suspending, you're artificially suspending the deletion of information, the process of, of trending towards heat death. And it's happening in a highly localized scale. And so that's why our souls, our brains, produce something that we experience as consciousness. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, there's probably more, there's probably a better way to articulate all that. So that's good. That's some, that's some good podcasting right there. Mm -hmm.